This is Gigabyte B650E EOS Pro X USB 4 and this is a top of the line motherboard that is being released right now and there's only a few months left before the new generation of motherboards arrives to the market. How good is this motherboard and why would Gigabyte do such a thing? Let's discuss in this video. The Pro X should land just between B650E Elite and B650E Master being almost the top tier motherboard for the B650E. Let's begin with the visual overview and because this board is basically a top tier EORS board, it has typical EORS style. Black PCB, dark colored heat sinks, all kinds of EORS and Gigabyte logos everywhere. I consider this board really good looking, there's really nothing to complain about, it's good. Well, at least if you like the style of Gigabyte motherboards. The VRM heatsink is massive, the M.2 heatsinks are also quite good, especially the one that close to the CPU, but we will discuss them in detail just a little bit later. There are many small details that are all over the motherboard, like this logo right here on the bottom left of the heatsink. I really enjoy such small details on expensive motherboards, though I understand it's going to be covered by the GPU. And by the way, the EOROS logo on the VRM heatsink is also RGB, also a thing that Gigabyte starting to add recently to its top tier motherboards. But here's a big question. Why would this motherboard arrive to the market right now? There's like a month left before the new generation of Ryzen CPUs hit the market with new generation of motherboards. We already have leaked information about 800 series motherboards and here's an interesting thing. This board fully qualifies as an X870 motherboard. Gigabyte is showing us how an 800 series board would look just a little earlier. At least that's my best guess. Now let's look in detail what this board has on board. The integrated sound is ALC1220, a very good integrated sound. On the bottom of the board there are 6 4-pin fan headers, dual RGB 5 volt headers, dual USB 2 headers and other front panel headers. And if you think that's all of the fan headers, well, there are even more on the other side. On the right side there's USB 3 front panel header, 4 SATA ports, a Type-C 20 gigabit port and an HDMI port for cases that have internal screens. Bear in mind though that it only supports Full HD 30Hz, so it's only for a rather simple screen. And on the top side there's another 5 volt RGB header, 12 volt RGB header, dual 4 pin fan headers, power and reset buttons, an actual postcode indicator that you can only see on top tier motherboards right now. The back panel is pretty rich looking, but bear in mind these four USB ports, they only connect it to 5 gigabit controller, so they basically act as a USB hub with 5 gigabit total throughput. If you have some very high speed devices, connect them to red USB ports. There's four USB 2.0 ports and extra two 10 gigabit USB red ports. There's also a 2.5 gig Ethernet controller and Wi-Fi 7 antenna. And of course, USB 4 ports, two of them to be exact. Bear in mind, only one of them can connect you with full 40 gigabits. If you plug in both, you will get 20 gigabits each. They have DisplayPort capability and also Thunderbolt capability, at least in specifications of this controller. Interesting thing that Gigabyte doesn't list Thunderbolt in specifications, but the controller specifications list Thunderbolt support. One other interesting thing is the new Wi-Fi antenna that you just need to plug in now. No need to screw it in. It's that simple to install now. And because this is an X-series motherboard, the Wi-Fi antenna is directional. Just face it towards your Wi-Fi access point and you will have better Wi-Fi speeds. Now, in terms of PCI Express connectivity, this board has, well, interesting features. If you're really into a lot of fast M.2s, this might be just for you, but you might not like all the design choices of this motherboard. The PCI Express slot for the graphics card is reinforced, you will need to pull with 50 kilos of force in order to pull it out, but it doesn't mean you don't need the support bracket for your 4090, this is only to ensure the PCI Express slot itself is going to stay in place. One other cool feature is the button that allows you to release the graphics card from the slot, really nice new feature. Other cool feature is that because this is an next gen motherboard, you can install and remove heat sinks without any tools. This board has four M.2s, three of them are covered by this, well, quite a reasonable heatsink, and the closest to the CPU M.2 has this huge heatsink that can cool down even a 5.0 SSD. 
Now let's discuss the PCI Express layout because this board is complicated. You might want to listen carefully here to understand if this is the board for you or you might want to look at something else. Because the PCI Express layout is not exactly standard. The main PCI Express GPU X16 slot is 5.0, the closest M.2 is also 5.0. The last four lanes of the CPU is being used by the USB 4 controller, so no second M.2 from the CPU on this motherboard. The second M.2 is using chipset lanes and it also shares lanes with the second from the bottom PCI Express slot, so it's one or the other. And the bottom PCI Express slot has only two 3.0 lanes, don't put a graphics card in there. What about the other two M.2s? If you install anything in those two M.2, you will lose eight lanes from the GPU, so they share lanes with the main X6 slot. And I mean anything, if you install anything in any of those M.2s, the GPU will lose 8 lanes. Bear in mind that most GPU will not lose any performance or maybe lose 1-2% performance from going from 16 to 8, but still, you should know that. If that's something you don't like, this is not a motherboard for you. But if you want to have a lot of PCI Express 5.0 connectivity for your M.2s, I guess this is a good motherboard. And if you're familiar with B650 or Smaster, it has a similar PCI Express layout, so Gigabyte decided to do the same thing here. But if you decide to install 8000 series CPUs in this motherboard or basically any other motherboard on the market, you will immediately lose 5.0 connectivity, the graphics card PCI Express slot will have 8 or even four lanes, the extra two CPU M.2s will stop working completely. So if you decide to buy those very stupidly overpriced CPUs for whatever reason, you will lose a lot of PCI Express connectivity on this motherboard. So I suggest you just don't buy them. Just get a 7 or 9000 series CPU. Now let's discuss the VRM of this motherboard. These two heatsinks are basically acting as one because they're connected by a heat pipe. The CPU is being powered by dual 8 pins, but trust me, one is more than enough for Ryzen CPUs. If you don't have the second one, don't even bother. I decided to take off the heatsink and look at the VRM, and as you can see the heatsink is massive. It's really huge, there's really nothing to complain about. The CPU VRM has 8 plus 8 configuration, consisting of 80 amp smart power stages. This VRM with such a heatsink is an overkill for any Ryzen CPU. And yeah, it's not 16 phase, it's only doubled 8 phases, still it's more than enough for anything AMD can release for this platform. So you absolutely no need to worry about the VRM. RAM. It's good enough for anything. So just to be sure, I run a 7950X one and a half hour stress test with no active cooling. The room temperature was 26 degrees. And with no active cooling, the VRAM temperature was only 82 degrees. Which is a really good result, there's really nothing to complain about. Now you might be wondering, what is this small heatsink under the main VRAM heatsink? And the answer is simple, it's the USB 4 controller. It requires some cooling, that's why there's a secondary heatsink under the main heatsink. And if you're one of those people who need USB 4 in modern motherboards, please let me know in the comment section. I'm especially interested what kind of devices you're using. And also, you need to know that USB 4 and Wi-Fi 7 only works in Windows 11. Basically, Windows 10 is no-go for this motherboard. Drivers for USB 4 and Wi-Fi 7 for Windows 10 just do not exist. Now let's discuss memory and specifically memory overclocking. This board has only 6 PCB layers, not 8 for a typical high-tier motherboard, so Gigabyte doesn't really advertise anything fancy for memory overclocking. But they still list 8000 MHz as supported memory modules, but that is, well, borderline BS. Me and my friend who is really into memory overclocking has done a lot of tests during the streams on my native language channel. And this board is absolutely typical board. You want to buy typical 6000 memory kit for the Ryzen CPU for this motherboard. If you want to go above 6400 and enable 1 to 2 ratio for the controller, you might be able to reach 7400 at best. So what's the conclusion? Well, this is a good top tier motherboard. It's gonna be expensive, probably around 300 US dollars, but it's still good enough. You may not like the PCI Express layout because some of the M.2 steals lanes from the CPU, but otherwise it's a really good board and it even has a postcode indicator. Gigabyte is probably trying to show us how an X870 board will look in a few months, but releasing it now under the B650E chipset. And if that's the case, well, then 800 series boards will be basically the same as 600 series but with USB 4. If you like this motherboard there's really no reason not to buy it. Thank you for watching this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.